Check one, two. Ladies and gentlemen, it's past 6 p.m. Uh, we should soon start. Please pick a seat, take your seat. So today's meeting is a makeup for the one that we couldn't in September. That was because of the uh, interrupted our effort. And today's topic is uh, intervention. We will have to wait. Dr. Meda is driving. He will be a little late. He will bring some new data he wants to show. But until then, according to my uh, previous notes, Dr. Meadow was supposed to uh, be the first speaker. By the way, there will be really no official speakers. There will be no official uh, lectures. It's like an open discussion how uh, we planned this meeting today. Um, the first topic will then be the patient preparation for intervention. And now um, uh, there are a handful of interventionalists or near interventionalist present in, in the room. Uh, I, let, let me start the uh, discussion with an interesting uh, question, and please join in. And the question is, in order to expedite uh, door to growing times, should we skip shaving the patient? I'd, I'd like to see if there is any, um, there are any um, team members here who do not shave the patient. If you could show your hands. Everyone is shaving patients. Yeah, what I mean is um, usually, I, I know there are people around, there are people out there who kind of never shave the patient. Right. I, I think shaving is not the rate limiting step. The rate limiting step is really whether you do physiologic imaging or not, and whether you activate the team based on the clinical picture or whether you wait to the completion of the imaging. And so I find that. You know, there's usually one extra person that can shave while you do other things, while you gown up or do something. So I don't mm -hmm. really think that's the measure. But I honestly think that if you don't shave, it doesn't make a difference. Mm -hmm. Are there any other preparation process that can be skipped in order to uh, think about, in order to expedite uh, door to groin? So. Again, the question is, you know, what is your your workflow? The workflow that we have started is to use in-house resources to get the patient prepped on the table. So we use an ED nurse, we use an NICU nurse to get the patient situated on the table, get the patient restrained, get the patient marked for the pulses, all that stuff that has to happen before. And um, we have done cases where the interventional nurse actually arrives basically at time of closure. Oh. Question, how far is your uh, angio room from ED? 
Well, the last 12 weeks it was a long distance, but now it's like just right across from the ER. But before it was in the cath lab, so it was really, you know, 100 yards or something. My other question uh, was supposed to be then, who is moving the patient, patient from uh, cat scan to your room? The ideal workflow is you identify the patient based on the pre-alert. The interventionist is already looking at the CT. You're either already driving and getting a report that there's no hemorrhage or you're making a decision to start driving because there's no hemorrhage and there's a hyperdense MCA or there's a very good story. And then at that point, the team will take the patient over to the interventional lab. So it will be the ED nurse, it will be the NICU nurse. Um, but did you standardize that it is all the ED nurse? Well, the ED nurse per definition stays with it, and our uh, NICU nurse per definition per our protocol responds to all the stroke alerts. That's the NICU stroke scale, so we have two team members that will take this patient over. So you move an NICU nurse if there is every a stroke alert, outpatient stroke alert. Every. I mean, um, um, an EMS. Yes, every stroke every alert. stroke alert. The NICU stroke scale is being done, and the process quality is being done by the NICU nurse at that way. But every facility has slightly different protocols, so. Okay. So it'd be interesting, Ritesh is not here because I, you know, obviously Ritesh has one of the best numbers door to groin that I know. And so I don't know how exactly he does it in terms of workflow, but I'm sure he also uses ED resources to get the patient on the table. And his lab is, you know, I think one floor down and Anyone, any questions regarding getting the patient to the table and uh, prepping the patient? ED nurse. ED transport. What we have done is we've done a couple of mock stroke codes. They're a little bit clumsy every time because they're not that realistic. Um, we've learned from, from workflow. So for instance, when you have two different providers, you sometimes have two different technique styles. So we actually have two boxes, one per provider who's on call. And um, we started off putting all the stuff in there. At one point, we realized that putting the expensive stuff into the box is, is a mistake. We had one ED nurse drop a stent retriever onto the floor, which is a $6,000 mistake or $7,000, so that really hurts um, out of all the things you want to drop. <laughs> but um, so we have the basic tools. So we have a box where I can say to the ED staff, there's usually a nurse, there's often a technician, and then they have the NICU nurse, and then have anesthesia that does the, the, the sedation. They come in, and I can tell that one resource, just open everything in this box onto this table. You know, I, I usually open the tray. I put the sterile drape on top of the, the table. At St. Mary's, they actually have a ready-to-go tray. It's already covered and ready to go. I don't know what the, what the hygiene rules on that are, but. You mean that um, before they go home during a regular work day? Yes. They open up a stroke tray? They open a tray and tray. cover it. When the patient arrives, they just uncover and everything is Correct. ready to go. Yeah. I think the, the volume is, in many centers, just too variable to really justify doing that. So we open the tray, and then we just have that one resource say, everything that's not already in the tray, open this entire box. Everything you find in there, just put you know, uh -huh. sterilely open it. And at that time, you know, I, I do the puncture. Uh -huh. You use some standard equipment uh, for your engines at least uh, when you are at home, so that your um, team always knows that your favorite hide your favorite. And, and I, I would argue every provider has sort of a go-to technique mm -hmm. that they start off with. So you could probably standardize it in that fashion and make sure that you go to your, at least through diagnostic setup in the beginning. That, especially when you're not having CTA images, you know, some providers take the patient just based on the story. And that's the numbers. When, when we have door-to-groins of under 
45 under 30 minutes, that's when we skip the CTA. We just go to the lab. Now, Ritesh is not here, but he mentioned to me the case of wha what he did um, when uh, Maria Hurricane arrived. Right. You probably know about the case. Right. When um, uh, does he come? Do you know? I, I don't know. Is he going to be here? So well, I don't I know, know. I'm, I'm familiar with the case because I've reviewed it as part of peer review. Uh -huh. we, we review all go, the interventions. Go ahead and you know, probably more yeah. than I do. So this is a case where a patient uh, came in and uh, as part of the hurricane, for some reason, even though they are technically on backup power, uh, the CT scanners, both CT scanners were down. They had no imaging. So they took the patient who just came in as you know EMS was shutting down to the angio table and did a cone beam CT on the on the uh, flat panel and then did the case. And the patient had a successful mechanical endolectomy. So um, our flat panel CT technology, unfortunately, is no not where we could completely skip CT. We have um, we have routinely used perfusion angiography. Angiography on the table. No, no, perfusion and geography. All the all the uh, newer uh, systems do perfusion and geography. GE does it, Siemens does it. Um, I find it a bit of a gimmick. It like, makes pretty pictures, but decision making at that point is already done. So I, I, I didn't actually buy the. But if you if you have a good cone beam CT, or we're going to have a CT scanner, and the patient never leaves the table and just turns and goes into the angio suite, but that is so hard to make financially viable because you can't really use the angio table during the day and can't use the CT table during the day. So it's really a very complicated setup. So we don't have that. I'm not sure how it's going to be penetrating the market, but yeah. So. Okay. Let, let me see what other notes I had. Um, okay. The definition of groin and door to groin time. Um, what is your groin time? The the initial definition for my groin start in 2015 and 16 was arterial puncture. However, it is true that the interventionalist or the team shouldn't be should be punished when you have to go to radial access or the patient just doesn't have good access because you've still got good process. So the process metric now is skin puncture. And I think that's being done the way uniformly. Everybody, the moment you puncture skin to give anesthetic or do anything, that's considered puncture. And I asked the same question uh, recently uh, at a large international meeting and very quickly they came to a consensus that it is when the groin sheet is in. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's why I'm bringing right. this up because I mean, me usually, usually the difference is what one minute. Well, right? not always. I mean, there's sometimes when you're really struggling, you have to go to the other side, or you have to go to the hand, or some some other complicating factor. And the question is, does that mean you have bad process just because the patient has no arteries? So anybody here from Palmetto? Okay. The, the, reason, the reason I was asking, because I was at Palmetto uh, covering Ritesh when um, we had a case when the uh, C-arm, uh, the uh, neuroangio suite was actually malfunctioning. They thought that it was only the lateral view malfunctioning. I did the uh, femoral, actually, I did the lidocaine, and then I wanted to visualize the femoral head, because... Uh, patient was big or I don't remember why. Usually I don't do that, but in that particular case I wanted to see the femoral head. And it turns out that even the AP view doesn't work. So at that point there was no, basically no x-ray. And um, the patient seemed like a real case. We had to move the patient. And uh, they said, okay, groin time is now. And I said, no, we are not in the groin yet. But Dr. Koshals, by his definition, this is the growing time. So it took another hour to t take the patient to the OR, to the hybrid room, where actually I did the uh, real groin puncture. The question is... The question, the, the question is who defines it, and I think we should go by the definition that's put out by Get With the Guidelines. 
and get with the guidelines. I don't know if we have anybody here from the team, but the way I've been told by our stroke coordinators, the definition is skin puncture. It, it def defines it, uh, the term skin puncture. I never in, read that, though. Yeah, no, it's in that, it, there's like a text, right? Oh, Justin. Well, but, but CT, for instance, also defined as the scout view of the CT, correct? The scout view. If you can't get other images, that's not, they don't care. But that's only because the uh, CT times, the CAT scan uh, images with the scout view hour and minute. So the definition in here is pretty clear. I'm having the the CSTK measure for CSTK9 l l up here, and it says skin puncture. So that's the definition. Skin puncture with the lidocaine needle? It just says skin puncture. It doesn't say arterial puncture. So the arterial puncture is a second data point that we actually document in our lab. So it's usually, like you said, one or two minutes, but sometimes there's 10 minutes. But it's for, for us, it's two data points. But get with the guidelines specifically asks for skin puncture as part of the groin puncture. Whoever wrote that didn't think the whole problem circle over, or not enough. And so it's actually revised here. It says, Joint Commission suspended data collection for CSDK07, median time to revascularization. A new measure, CSDK9, arrival time to skin puncture was added effective January 1st, 2017. And the original, the previous definition? It was time to revascularization. And again, you could argue, is like, what is the real meaningful pa uh, parameter for the patient as well as when the arteries open? But does that mean you have bad process because the patient has torturous vessels or can't be revascularized or things like that? It takes four passes. The answer is good process is indicated. You have somebody in the lab that can do the procedure with skin puncture. Now, there have been some criticisms, like if you have um, adjuvant staff doing the skin puncture, like a resident or somebody that can't really do the procedure, and then you come in 20 minutes later, that obviously defeats the measure. We don't do that. So it's the interventionalist who can do the procedure that does skin puncture, and then we track a second measure, which is arterial puncture. And you know, if, the, if there's consensus that you want to track arterial puncture, I'm open to it, but it has to be uniform. Yeah, and get with the guidelines says uniform. skin puncture. Yeah, absolutely, it has to be uniform. I requested this salad to be brought out at around uh, 6 30. And until then, we have... Um, one or two more topics. Uh, let's talk about anesthesia. Uh, Nils, what do you do with uh, your patients anesthesia-wise? Anesthesia is a wide open topic, and I think this is something that everybody has a very strong opinion about, but realistically it probably is not as relevant as we make it out to be. So if you look at the existing data, we have 4,000 plus patients of retrospective data that says uh, sedation is better. And that may be because patients who are sicker, patients who have more severe strokes, larger stroke volume, get more anesthesia. 
When you look at the one negative randomized trial, which is called the Siesta trial, you have a strong effect towards anesthesia with anesthesia patients, I believe, reaching almost like 60% good clinical outcome and uh, conscious sedation patients reaching 18% good clinical outcome. We don't see 18% good clinical outcome. We see that in the placebo arm of PROACT. So something is wrong with that trial, and so, therefore we can't go by one trial and say, you know, anesthesia is better, conscious sedation is bad. And the subsequent randomized trials like Anstroke and others showed no difference. And I think in the end, it probably doesn't matter. If you have good anesthesia, you can do it fast, it doesn't delay your process time, and the patient doesn't drop their pressure, by all means do anesthesia if that makes you more happy. If you think you can do it quickly, it's probably cheaper to do it with constant sedation. It's nice to see the patient start moving their arm afterwards. I actually like it if they complain of a headache. I'm a little bit more cautious. So I don't mind having conscious sedation, but if I find an M3 occlusion, I wish you know my conscious sedation was actually general anesthesia. And I've had one ta patient recently who decided to get up in the middle of my conscious sedation, had to take everything out, intubate the patient, because you know the nurse anesthetist just couldn't get the patient down. So it has its pros and cons. So my story with um, minimal anesthesia or minimal sedation started with an anesthesiologist who in the middle of the night uh, showed up and he well, we can't do anesthesia on this patient because we don't know the patient's history. We don't know uh, what medications he's allergic to. I'm not willing to do anesthesia or sedation or anything on this patient. I said, okay, you can stay out of the paper. I can do it in anesthesia. So we did the whole uh, MCA clot removal in uh, local. And um, after that, I did more and more and more. Um, and I ended up, do you always have anesthesia on the bedside? Anesthesiologist. So they come along with the team. Okay. Uh, we do that too. But... Um, I was nurse anesthetist as part of being a trauma center, so they pull that one as they're calling in the backup for the trauma because you always have to have one open team member, and so usually I get the nurse anesthetist, but most of them are pretty good, and you know, giving Presidex is not rocket science. We would do it without an anesthetist if we had nurses that are comfortable doing it, but our nurses don't touch Presidex, so it's like an administrative uh, direction. Um. In cath lab is initially ER, and then once we arrive, we have a beta patient from the from the unit. They can't give Nimbex. I don't know why. What do you do at the Cleveland Clinic? As far as anesthesiology, um, anesthesiology is always um, available. Um, depends on the situation of the patient. Most of the time we do, but not always. Um, do we do Presidex? Uh, our nurses are not all trained in Presidex. That would be um, excellent if they were, but they're not. So if uh, if we have to give conscious sedation, you know, we're given uh, a little bit of first head and fentanyl. Technically, it is possible to do these uh, in local anesthesia in many of the patients, but not, not all. Um, I usually know after the uh, femoral puncture if the patient will be able to uh, hold steady uh, for the whole case. And um, if the patient is steady for the diagnostic angiogram, then I ask the anesthesiologist to stand by and work on the patient. Yeah, um, sorry I'm late. Uh, so for the last three years, so the first six months um, you know, after I joined Memorial, we kind of tweaked um, uh, on a, I would say, pretty regular basis our anesthesia and sedation protocols. Uh, initially it was, uh, and this is where the trials came out, we were doing GA for all cases, uh, thrombectomy cases um, around uh, mid-2014. And uh, we switched over to just having support, 
but not doing any sedation. We tried Presidex for a couple of months, but what we noticed is uh, it would um, cause a lot of hemodynamic issues, hypotension, bradycardia, and uh, the time for its peak effect is usually within 30, 45 minutes. By that time, we with the case, the patient would be, uh, you know, uh, so sort of their neurological assessment is difficult. Um, so we did away with Prasadex also given the cost issues. Um, and so we just, as Laszlo said, just titrate, fentanyl, Versed, um, start nothing, and then ask from there. Uh, usually just restraints, tape the head. And so we have a series now probably of about um, 80 to or that we've done without any sedation. Um, and I think it's more from the standpoint of it's not something that, you know, to report that, okay, we're proud of that. It's just, I think, from a safety standpoint first and then efficacy. So it's safe, first of all. And, you know, the thing that people worry about is risk of uh, micro catheter, micro wire perforation with. Um, and, you know, most of the time, especially with these, you know, MCA syndromes, the patients have neglect. They might be confused, but they're not frequently agitated. And in those cases, you know, just low doses of fentanyl and Versed are adequate. So I would still favor no sedation as part of the protocol, and then just have an understanding with the critical care nurses. So anesthesiologists are no longer involved in the care of our stroke patients unless we need intubation, in which case we just call rapid response. Uh, because the issue with anesthesia was uh, more from, you know, that they couldn't support us. They needed 30 to 45 minutes um, during after hours especially to get their team in. And um, that with the workflow and that patients, if you're trying to achieve door to puncture within 60 minutes, uh, it contradicts, uh, you know, conflicts with everything you're trying to do. Uh, let me suggest that uh, let us take care of the food now. Um, after we eat, then uh, Dr. Uh, Meda will, well, it depends if he gets ready by that time with his lecture. If he's not ready, then we will continue the discussion with the next topic, which will be, um, all of you have a good appetite.
try this? Please? Yes. Yeah, it works. No, but it doesn't work there. What do you mean? It's fine. Don't worry about it. So uh, while you guys enjoy your dinner, I think I, I wanted to use the time to show you some data, which is technically embargoed, but I think it's, it's very valuable data, so it's worthwhile talking about it as part of this discussion. As you guys know, we've been in South Florida in a unique situation that we have three counties basically under bypass. We've got the two northern counties, Palm Beach and Broward County, under 100% bypass, and we've got a severity-based bypass in Miami-Dade County. And so I just wanted to show you some of the data that we have from, get, from the Florida Puerto Rico Registry Get With the Guidelines data, because I think it's very important to see how much impact that has. And I think the important thing to note is why we are where we are right now. And the, the traditional model that a lot of the country still has is that we have a academic stroke service and then in the community hospitals we have community neurologists that basically run from the clinic to give TPA whenever they're absolutely forced to do so. And the new model that we have here predominantly in uh, the tri-county area is in-house neurohospitalists that are present, they're much more aggressive, they're vascular boarded, and they're, they're basically able to give much higher rates of TPA than other people. And um, I'm gonna show you some of those, the data that I presented for the EMS medical director. You guys know all that. What I'm gonna focus on is the development over the past 15 years, because the problem is that in the literature, the data lags compared to what we're doing here in South Florida. So. If, if you're looking at the data in terms of the growth of TPA, it's obviously been dramatic. We have to give some credit to the American Heart Association target stroke, uh, but there is no good metric as to what the new normal for uh, the door to needle time should be. Uh, this is data from 2016. So we have an 11% national rate of IV TPA treatment. Florida is slightly above average at 11 per six but um, we have much higher rates in certain areas, like our hospital system, which I have uh, access to, is almost twice that of the rate of Florida. And the door to needle times have come down dramatically. So what we need to do is we need to ex actually benchmark ourselves against South Florida. We see the impact of those numbers. This is the pre and post target stroke. You can see the, the decrease in all the metrics, uh, mortality, independent state, length of stay, et cetera. Um, so why were our TPA rates in the past so low? The reason is we were going to centers that had physicians that were not interested in TPA treatment. And uh, primarily office-based neurologists that are in primary stroke centers. We have now in South Florida bypassed those, and I know this is just, you know, up for debate, but the solution is to use neurohospitalists. And this is really what we've done. We've gone from going to the nearest stroke center, we've going, we're going now to the uh, comprehensive stroke center. The default treatment is now to treat. And that really has taken the median door to needle times uh, down into the 30 minute range. And the challenge that we run up to is still these Demarchal criteria, everybody knows them. Uh, we probably have a number of neurologists or stroke coordinators here. The challenge is, what is excluding this patient from treatment? And uh, it's in the eye of the beholder. So you can go in the database and say you're treating 100% of eligible patients and treating only 5% of all your ischemic stroke uh, admissions to going to treat 20% of all ischemic strokes. The new door to needle time in South Florida is 30 minutes. We've had a recent uh, award presentation in South Florida for the get for the Florida Puerto Rico Registry Awards, and I'm obviously very happy to say that two of my facilities have reached um, the number one and two spots, uh, with Palmetto reaching 26 minutes median door to needle time, and then St. Mary's meeting 28 minutes. Jackson was a uh, far number fourth. I don't know where, who else was in there, but that's the numbers I can share with you. But the issue is these numbers are attainable. 
If you have that kind of approach, if you don't rely on community neurologists, if you have hospitals, if you have the right process, this is absolutely attainable. I'm going to skip all that because I presented it for the EMS medical directors. I just want to go to the real numbers that um, I wanted to talk about, and that is obviously we all buy into the concept of pre-alert. Pre-alert allows us to differentiate whether these are mild strokes that are probably not going to the lab and severe strokes that have a high probability of large vessel occlusion. And Rajesh has lived it. Five is probably not the cutoff. Seven is probably much better to really activate the team. And, and the question is, do we really have value in pre-alerting the team? What's the yield? That, that is all up for discussion. But there is benefit of tightening the system when you get a pre-alert because you have much shorter door to puncture times. Because those patients that have rapid progression, they will be harmed. The rapid progressors are the ones that you would exclude if they're secondarily transferred because they just don't make it to the lab. They already have core infarct. These dawn patients that you treat up to 12 hours and now, they're all going to be fine, but it's far in between. The large group of patients are going to be the rapid progressors. You have to build your system of care to, to treat that. Look at this number needed to treat. We all know this, but... If you treat within 120 minutes, the number needed to treat is 2.3 decaying rapidly. So our system of care in South Florida is probably among the best, but still, we still have a lot of slack in there in treating those patients early um, to get them treated. And the Dawn uh, data is now published. Look at, look at those, those outcomes, 48% good outcomes versus 13% just published um, in the New England Journal. So I think we're very... Very proud of that data. And uh, what we need to take home from Stratus, for instance, is we need to look at our processes. When you look at hospitals that have more than 30 cases, you're going to get better process times, better door to puncture times. Median door to puncture in Stratus was 73 minutes. We don't know what the median door to puncture time is in South Florida. That data doesn't exist. What we know from Stratus is, for instance, that half of the patients were treated, uh, were transferred under 14 miles. And we know the impact of transfers from this paper that it's about 103 minutes door in, door out time from a primary to a comprehensive stroke center. Just door, door in, door out uh, at the primary stroke center. The delay to interventional treatment is two hours, 116 minutes. 8% of the transfer cohort overall was less independent. However, that doesn't look at the patients that were actually a priori excluded because they had bad aspect scores and so on. So this is actually not the true number. The true number is 13% decay um, between patients who are transferred and who are not within 20 miles. And comprehensive stroke centers are faster. So I think in South Florida, we've proven that doing that is much faster. I want to just get to the, uh, uh, I'm going to skip all that stuff. I'm going to show you the South Florida data. So 7.5% of all patients in the United States are currently treated with endovascular therapy. So if you have all ischemic strokes, if you look at the data and you're treating under 7.5%, you're below the average. That's an important metric. Um, and the, the challenge is that the treatment right now is still decided by and large by non-interventional neurologists in non-interventional centers. And the, so the treatment is to get the patient directly to a center where they have all capabilities available because you're going to get higher treatment rates, no transfers. In South Florida, you all know that we've had an increase in the attested um, comprehensive stroke center. Um, so th there's a large number of the primaries went up. We have 36,000 patients in the Florida Puerto Rico registry. And so the number of patients that transported directly from scene to CSC Rose and Broward and Palm Beach to 97, 86% respectively. So the, the bypass is in effect. We know it's, it's, it's working. Uh, in Miami-Dade, there is no bypass. It's a severity bypass. It's much less impressive. There's much less transfer in the two northern counties because of the direct to comprehensive all patients protocol. And look at the, the impact of that. So 81% of patients who received TPA were transported by EMS. So there's not a lot of these walk-in TPA patients. It's 19% of all the patients. 87% of all IV TPA treatment was now administered at a CSC. And look at this difference. 
If you're treated at a CSC where you have aggressive hospitalists, you have 18% treatment uh, at a CSC versus 12% of the primary. Now, it's somewhat unfair because there's a pre-selection, but I think it's an impressive group. Uh, it's, it's impressive data. This is just the, the number of TPA treatment. You, know, you can see the proportion in the comprehensive centers treated with TPA. And you can see how much more aggressive the comprehensive centers have become compared to the primaries. But I think the most important thing that we have to be proud of, and you can all give yourself a round of applause, both paramedics, EMS system, and the hospitals, is that we have now been able to give 19% of patients treatment within the so-called golden hours. So if you go to a comprehensive center, you have 19% chance of being treated with an hour for, of symptom onset. And the actual mean onset to TPA time has gone down with bypass, hasn't gone up. People said initially, well, if you bypass my local hospital, your treatment times from onset to treatment are going to go up. It's the opposite. It's, it's lower. It's 112 or 125 minutes. So I think that's all encouraging that we're on the right track. Look at those golden hour treatment rates. And if you compare them with the published literature, in the best published literature, CT-based ambulance, they treat 30% within the golden hour. We treat 19% just with the existing resources without spending an additional uh, million dollar per truck and all the, the extra human resources. So I think that's very encouraging. Um, for endovascular therapy, it's just as much important because you have this delay of patients who are being transferred. And I think this is really important data, that when you go to a comprehensive center, you have a higher chance of being treated with intervention. So we have in South Florida, in the current data, 6% overall treatment. So we're actually not much, much higher than the national average in the comprehensive centers alone. But uh, there are 9 out of 27 comprehensive centers that treat more than 10% of all their ischemic strokes with TPA. 5%, uh, 5 comprehensive centers treat 15% and 2 treat over 20% of all their admissions with ischemic strokes with endovascular therapy. So that, that, those are rates that are currently attainable. We can do that today. And so that in reverse means there's a couple centers that are below average. What we really need is a dashboard that helps us figure out where we are, benchmark ourselves against our neighbors, and get better as a, as a group. So that's really all I wanted to present today. Thank you. Thank you, and, and I think a lot of these results are because of this spirit of cooperation among the county, as we know, and, and, and thank you, and Dr. Men and Dr. Miskolski for a lot of that. But I wanted to see if we could do like a straw poll with Dawn coming out, and I know it just got published, and you guys are just looking at it now. Is there going to be an immediate push among everybody to, let's say, extend a 12-hour call time, or going to wait for the dawn to, you know, get it, let the data get sifted a little bit, or what do you think about that? So I would reverse the question set. Who has not practiced dawn so far? Because, for instance, our centers have triage protocols up to 24 hours already. Dawn is up to 24 hours, 6 to 12 to 24 hours. Uh, Prajesh, what is your what is your EMS algorithm? You know, when do you activate your team? 24 hours? So, so I don't think we have any centers that have been sticking to the six-hour window. I mean, Memorial probably under Dr. Duong was sort of at that point, but I think that's been long changed. So I don't know that there's really anybody. Well, I would be very honest. And, uh, yeah, Although officially we are still eight hours. This is our official, and of course we have the um, wake-up strokes. But... Um, Unofficially, we are uh, evaluating all patients within 24 hours with CT perfusion, CTA. Um, at Holy Cross, apparently, there is some resistance, sometimes not only small, but sometimes re really heavy resistance from uh, the emergency room, uh, citing 
um, financial uh, staffing issues. Uh, but um, but eventually, what what at the end of the day, we do all the uh, workup uh, of these patients, not only to 24 hours, sometimes even beyond 24 hours, and we catch those patients. I believe we catch all of them or most of them who are eligible for the uh, intervention. So my question is, at what point do you do perfusion studies? 8, 12, 24 hours, or do you? Well, I just saw that Ritesh has arrived. So I think this is a good question to bring him into the discussion because, again, this is where the voodoo starts. Like, for me, I have a default order on the chart if we suspect large vessel occlusion, we do CT, CTA, CT perfusion, unless there's somebody that says, I don't need this information anymore. I'm already having enough information to go to the lab. So it's a standing order, but you don't have to do it. You can opt out. If you see a hyperdense MCA, you say, I'm going to the lab now. But Ritesh, I don't know if you want to comment on that, because you're probably the most, um, uh, the least de perfusion dependent person here in the, in the audience. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I did do a perfusion scan today, but um, you know, it was, again, it just kind of highlights uh, what exactly, and you know, we were talking about this, um, so the CT scan already shows that there's basically sulcal effacement, left hemisphere, a uh, decent amount of swelling where you can see some compression of the ventricle as well, and you do the CT perfusion, and there's basically luxury perfusion in that area. So in fact, it, our radiologist also read it as a huge penumbra. When you're looking at the CT scan, you know for a fact that there's nothing there to save. So uh, overall, you know, we've had enough cases where CT perfusions have been very bad overall. I mean, we've missed cases because of that. And then, you know, they, they kind of say that there's salvageable penumbra when there's none. So I, I literally rely, I mean, my ratio is probably for every five interventions that I do, I do once advanced imaging CTA, CT perfusion. And it seems to work well.